Well, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Kevin Riley. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. I wanted to welcome you to this session, welcome you for, and thank you for being here so late in the day. So I'm going to guess we have a group of people really interested in what we're about to talk about. Um, let, me, let me open this, and you're going to get to meet these folks in a minute. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, so be ready to okay. introduce yourselves. But um, and let me start with this premise that our discussion will be based on the idea that certainly a smart city is a well-informed city. And we're going to dig into that with this impressive panel. Um, and to, to get into it, the first thing we're going to hear about is a remarkable story with, with that, that was done and has huge implications for our, one of our country's biggest cities, Philadelphia, and its newspaper, the Philadelphia, Philadelphia In Inquirer, long considered one of the best, if not the best, regional newspaper in the country, I would say, even, even sitting here in Atlanta. So um, we'll hear about how, this story and how it was told and the reaction to it. And it's very important, I think, to recognize this is a story done by a newspaper and a story that could only be done by a newspaper. As we dig into the story, we'll also move on to the future of newspapers and local news organizations and what those futures mean for cities who are looking to inform their citizens, including your city. Uh, so I promise you when you leave here today, you'll, you'll, you'll not only come away with a lot of information, but you'll be ready to act and think about what may need to happen in your city and what is important to know about the news outlets in your city. So with that, let's start right here with the introduction of the panel. Hi, I'm Wendy Ruderman, and I'm on the investigative team at the Philadelphia Inquirer, where I've worked for, um, I guess, since about 2002. So it's been a while, but, uh, and I work alongside Barbara Laker. Hi, I'm Barbara Laker. I'm also on the investigative team uh, with Wendy at the Philadelphia Inquirer, and I've worked there um, since 1993. Um, well, we used to work for the Daily News, but they now were the Inquirer, so. Great. And I'm, uh, I wish, I have wish, I wish I could see you all better. If you can hear me okay. I'm Terry Egger. I'm the publisher and the CEO at the Inquirer. Um, and when they say they work together, I can vouch for that because they are always together. And what their humility didn't tell you is they are, uh, the two of them are Pulitzer Prize winners for investigative stories that they did in our city some time ago. And uh, I, I use the word Pulitzer because it drives me nuts when people mispronounce it. Uh, for 10 years, I was at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch where I was publisher working for the Pulitzer family, so that's how I know how to say it, but uh, we're thrilled to be here with you. Yeah, thanks, thanks all of you for being here. So um, the story, Toxic City, describe it. I mean, either one of you start out, just give this group a feel and a good summary of what the story was and what it's about. Go ahead. Um, so Toxic City was actually, it took us three years to do it, and fortunately the Inquirer was willing to put the time and the resources into it, but the first uh, year we were looking at why children in Philadelphia are getting poisoned at far higher rates than in Flint, Michigan. And um, we discovered that uh, there was a lot of lead paint in old houses in Philadelphia, and that there were laws, but nobody was enforcing the laws, and a lot of children were getting um, sick in their homes that they were renting from slumlords, largely slumlords in Philadelphia. Um, and then from there, uh, we worked on lead in soil. Philadelphia is an old industrial town, so we set about educating people in a gentrifying neighborhood about um, lead in soil in playgrounds and in their own backyards. And we, we juxtaposed that with a building boom in the neighborhood that was churning up a lot of lead dust. So we were really trying to educate and activate the community members. And then the last part um, was just focused on schools. We wanted to take a look at, Philadelphia has some of the oldest schools in America. Um, on average, they're about 70 years old, I think, right? And there's, um, so we looked at asbestos, uh, lead in the schools, we looked at uh, lead in water, and we also looked at mold, and we did a real deep dive. We did something really unusual where we, in, we enlisted teachers and staff to help us do scientific tests inside the schools, and, um, and that was funded in part by the Lenfest Foundation, which um, Terry will talk to you about. 
talk a little bit more about some of the unique reporting methodology that you did and how you came up with those ideas and how people reacted to that. Well, we wanted to do more than just look at the maintenance reports and all the documents that we could get on the hazards, say, in the schools. And so to really, we don't have access to the schools, so what we had to do was um, enlist teachers and staffers at the schools, and then we got trained ourselves how to test for lead and asbestos in schools. We met with the teachers, and this was very courageous on their part because we promised them anonymity in the testing, but they were scared that their jobs were gonna be in jeopardy if they were caught doing these testing for us. And so we got the kits together, we gave them instructions, we bagged them up in Ziploc bags, we met them in like Dunkin' Donuts and different places across the city, explained how to do the testing, and we gave them written instructions, and then we would meet them after they did the testing. We took the tests to a certified lab to get the results, and so that was something that Wendy and I have, have never really done, where we felt like little scientists, and that's not something that journalists generally do. Um, but it was very, in the end, it proved to be very powerful because we found really alarming levels of asbestos and lead. And then also what we always know we need in a story like this is we need human examples to show that people are being and children are being harmed. And so one of the most poignant cases we found was of this little boy named Dean who was a first grader in a classroom. And unbeknownst to him and his parents, he was sitting in a desk with all this crumbling and peeling lead paint in the ceiling of his classroom. And it was falling on his desk and the floor next to him. He started to eat the paint chips because he didn't want a messy desk. He thought he'd get in trouble. And he didn't want to get up and put the chips in the trash can thinking he'd get in trouble. So he ate them and he ended up with a blood lead level of 46, which is off the charts. And he suffered terribly from this. He couldn't do math any. He used to be able to multiply like three times three. He couldn't do that anymore. He couldn't finish sentences. He was all over the, like his attention span was really um, damaged by it. And um, we also found children who were, um, had asthma in schools from mold and cockroaches that they only had the attacks in schools. And we also found for um, the two children or two or three children who actually got carbon monoxide poisoning in the school from workers who were doing work on the roof and they left a generator um, going and it went into the air intake in the classroom and one child passed out. And so we tried to combine the human element with the scientific element to, to bring it to life. So I'm gonna come back to the reporters a little bit more about you know, the, some of the conclusions and in particular the reaction and the community's reaction. But you, you said something as you were explaining the story that I have to go to the boss on. Yeah, okay. And that thing you said was three years. Yeah. <laughs> so Terry, talk about that a little bit. As the guy in charge in Philadelphia and, and the always demanding questions about resources, you know, and, and newspapers in the situation they're in. I mean, three years, really? Right, well, I, I, yeah, Kevin, it's, when you, when you pull back and you ask, what are we really, you know, I always ask and talk with our staff about why are we here? And we're here for the benefit of the people in our community. That's who we serve, ultimately. And I'll, I can talk more about that in a minute because of our very unique structure. But in this particular case, uh, this was a, anticipated that this was, there's a theory of the case that this was a real problem. And Barbara and Wendy, as I said, previous Pulitzer Prize winners, and the team that they have, Dylan Purcella and others, who wanted to dive into this project, um, we just felt that it was worthwhile. And so to take that much talent and put that much resource, we received funding from, uh, from our own foundation, the Linfest Foundation, for some of that. But we just felt that if you, if you pull back the, the, the onion all the way to the core, what is it that we do and why do we do it, it's to benefit our community. In this particular case, their amazing work had what we love to call the real proper cause and effect of the investigation, the storytelling, and then the consequence and result of it. What, what happened after the story came to light? What remedies, what benefits came to light because of their work? And I'll allow them to talk about that. And I would just say one other thing. There's no other news organization in our community or your community other than 
your local daily newsroom at a newspaper or digital news organization that wouldn't have the capacity or the willingness to invest that much time and energy and effort into a single story. So talk a little bit about you know, the big things that you ultimately found out as you dug through all this stuff and, and then a little bit of the reaction uh, to that. I mean, again, from the perspective of people who are thinking about cities and a city's health and a city's future and what cities must do for their citizens. Yeah, well, we're still seeing a tremendous amount of reaction and change. Um, it's actually hard to keep up with all the things that are changing. For instance, it was just announced um, or it was just revealed yesterday that a teacher is um, terminally ill with an asbestos-related cancer that's very rare. Um, and we had previously reported that can, um, that asbestos was going untreated and unrepaired in a lot of these classrooms, in, in particular where this teacher was teaching. So um, and when the stories first broke last year, we got the governor to, to uh, allocate more funding to clean up schools, and specifically based on our testing, where we found millions of asbestos fibers and settled dust. Um, they did emergency cleanup at seven of the schools, and one of those schools happened to be where this teacher had taught for years and years. Um, so today there was a call to bring more money to the school district and more urgency to, to clean up these schools. We also got a law passed in Philadelphia that requires schools to be um, lead safe before your kid can go into the building. And you would think, you know, oh, duh, like why would, parents are legally obligated to send their children to school, but yet the school district had been under no obligation to protect children from all of this peeling and flaking lead paint that can damage their brains. Um, there was no law surrounding that, so we got a law, uh, through our reporting and through the community getting involved, we got a law passed to address that. Um, also with the lead soil, the EPA came in and they've done a huge cleanup in the area that we've written about. Um, so just a lot of um, community dialogue and everybody working together to get things done. It's been really rewarding. So what was it like, I mean, how did you first approach a teacher to convince them to, to you know, do those tests for you? What was, what was that conversation like? I mean, It was really difficult because we're not education reporters, so we didn't have like a Rolodex full or a contact full of teachers. And so what we did is we went to conferences on weekends where teachers or union officials would be and we just approached them and we told them what we were doing um, in very simple terms. We told them that we were doing a story looking at the environmental health and possible environmental hazards in their school that both they could possibly be exposed to and children could be exposed to. We did get a lot of no's and we also reached out to a lot cold, um, contacting them through Facebook and other social media. Through word of mouth, we got names of, say, a school nurse or a teacher who may or may not be interested in talking to us. And so we we tapped into some advocates who were, were teachers in the district who were willing to help us. And it really was a it was really was a tough thing to do because we were asking a lot from them and we knew that, I mean, they had to come into school before school started, oftentimes to do the testing or after school ended. They did it in secret. They, um, we tried to help them. We gave them like a, a map and a list of possible places they might want to test based on maintenance reports that Dylan had done like this great data set for us that kind of mapped out where all the asbestos and lead had been in the past in each and every school in the district. Um, but it was very difficult. I think the reason why the teachers agreed to do this for us is because they, they really cared about the students and they cared about the children. And they knew that they came into school often. They told us every morning they would come in and there'd be mouse droppings on their desks. They'd be cockroaches. And they often came in early to clean up their classroom. So they could see visually that the school was in really deteriorated and in shambles and they cared about the kids and they wanted to protect them. So it wasn't only for their interest, it was to protect um, children. And I think they all felt like that every child in Philadelphia has the right to go to school and feel, be, feel and be safe 
and learn and play in a healthy environment? So for either one of the, the reporters, I mean, when you met the families with the children with health, I mean, what was that like? That must have been a very hard, those must have been terribly hard stories to do, right? I mean, what, Yeah. tell me about that, like sitting with those families and hearing those stories. What was that? I mean, it was really heartbreaking. A lot of it, the, the parents were very unaware of what was happening. I was, I was taken aback by how little both people in the school building, the teachers, and also the parents knew about the conditions, the real conditions of their school. So um, it was difficult to, to tell them that um, a test revealed millions of, of cancer causing asbestos fibers in settled dust that is potentially hazardous. Um, one parent, when I told her, we had teachers who wanted to test the water specifically, and um, we had a water result that came back extremely high at a fountain, and when I told the parent that the water came back very high for leg content, she started crying because her daughter already had behavioral issues, and her daughter already struggled with um, a form of autism, and I think that she just felt like, what more? You know, I'm already up against so much, and why can't my kid have drinking water that's not poisonous? And so she, she started crying, and I'd find myself getting emotional about it, too. Um, you know, I have kids, and I think, I think having kids, you, you can really connect with other parents about the things that fill them with angst. So, you know, one of the reasons I really was excited to be here today and do this panel is because what you're hearing, this is what newspapers do, and they're crucial local news organizations that where cities have depended on the communication and information they provide as they wrestle with problems like these and others, and it's what newspapers do. But Terry, we both know that whole business model, that whole way of doing things is at great risk, and you've been in the middle of, of trying to find some solutions to that. Talk a little bit about what's going on in Philadelphia, which is, I can let you know, is one of the places that has worked hardest to, to figure out a future for local journalism and for this kind of work to be done. Great, thanks Kevin. And, and just one other um, comment about Barbara and Wendy's work is that, as, as uh, Wendy mentioned in the beginning, it was about homes uh, first, then it was about playgrounds, and then it was about schools. And there were over the three years of investigative reporting and storytelling, in each case, as the, the information came forward, these were not things where people were trying to hide or cover up something. These were things that, because of their investigation, had exposed an immediate reaction in each and every case by city council, by the mayor and the governor, with funding and action so that the rules that were already in place to protect homes now were being enforced. The playgrounds that they tested, which were off the charts, immediately remediated, and now the issues that they talked about in terms of fixing things in the schools. And when Kevin talks about newspapers, I think I would just ask that you conjure not the physical product you hold in your hand. Because we talk with our news organization and our journalists all the time about, you know, we don't work for a print product. We work telling stories whatever people, whatever way they want to receive them, digitally, on their phone, or their desktop, laptop, printed paper, whatever it might be. But it's the engine of the news organization. And in each of your communities, large or small, and I, again, I can't see you and I don't know where you're from, but I can guarantee you this, that the major news organization in your community is a shadow of what it was 10 or 15 years ago in terms of the number of resources. And the economic crisis that is hitting our industry, the complete disruption, if you will, of the flow of the revenue we used to receive from advertising that is now diverted primarily to the two platforms, because we invest in the talent like Wendy and Barb in our newsrooms and we used to count on the audience that we reached being able to be monetized through advertising and or subscription. Well, today, we still invest in the talent, but the distribution model, because of the, to the credit of Facebook and Google, they built the best distribution models in the history of the world and engagement, but their distribution of our content, they're the ones who receive all the monetization of it in the advertising world, and so it is dried up the, the revenue stream necessary to fund news organizations in each and every one of your communities. So we're working as an industry to try to change that. It's critical. But what's more important, I think, is just as you, if, 
I always say, say to folks, the average citizen isn't aware of this, nor you know, would you think they would be. But it's critical because if you wake up one day and your news organization isn't there anymore, such as Youngstown, Ohio, which last month announced its daily newspaper is gone. It's gone. Pittsburgh, our friends the other side of the state, they're down to two days a week. And this is happening with rapid speed all over the country, and it will continue unless and until we can A, inform people, B, create a, an opportunity to have a new discussion and negotiation with the platforms about paying for the content and being about sharing the economics of the value we do create, and C, and I think this is important, I think raising the awareness in our communities that the public support of what we do is, is really, really fundamentally important. And I'll, I'll pause for a second and just want to reflect on the gentleman who brought me to Philadelphia because I had retired from the Cleveland Plain Dealer. It's a gentleman who we all loved and he passed away last year, a philanthropist named Jerry Lenfest. And Jerry Lenfest made his money in cable television and he and his wife Marguerite sat out to give away the billions that they had earned uh, away in their lifetime. And they were very modest people. They flew coach, they lived in the same 2,000 square foot house they had in 1996. They got air conditioning about three years ago. And yet they gave away over $100 million to Columbia, over $100 million to the Art Museum. And in the end, Jerry, through a whole series of circumstances, ended up, along with a partner named Lewis Katz, in May of 2014, purchasing the Enquirer, the Daily News, and Philly.com. The same week that they became the owners of the properties, tragically, Lewis Katz was killed in a plane crash. Uh, Lou Katz, some of you may have known, used to own the New Jersey Devils, New Jersey Nets, a self-made man, and tragically lost Lou. And so Jerry, at 84 years old, found himself now the sole owner of the properties. And he had, a, he had an epiphany about, and as he said in his words, of all the things that he and his wife had tried to do, to do good in their community with the blessings they'd received, supporting culture and the arts, which are important, supporting education in the community, which is vitally important. And he said, and people talk about arts and culture and they talk about education, they talk about the need for support. And he says, and we should. But his aha moment was, are any of them any more important than the fundamental independent journalism that serves the communities in which we live? What would these communities be without independent public investigation, holding the public officials accountable, celebrating the wins in a community, talking and uncovering things like Wendy and Barb did. If you try to picture a world like that, it's not a very pretty picture because the unintended consequences over time are not good. So Jerry said the most important thing he could ever do in his life would be to keep journalism alive in the city that he loved. And I think that's a conversation that we had hoped that you take away from here uh, and, and try to look at the health of the news organization, the primary news organization in your community. And I'll leave you with one last favorite um, shocking kind of statistic about the importance of what's going on. Uh, the Freedom House out of DC two years ago had commissioned a study and issued this study that looked at the planet Earth and on the planet Earth, the entire population on the planet Earth, how many people live and wake up every day enjoying a truly free and independent press serving where they live? And it's 13% of the humans on the planet enjoy a free and independent press every day. And the aha for me was if you draw a correlation between the individual freedoms those people enjoy and that free and independent press, they're almost direct. And so that's what we're fighting for. We love what we do. Uh, we are a public benefit corporation now based on Jerry's mission. Not a dollar that we earn goes to anyone's pocket. It, it either stays in the organization or goes to profit sharing because our primary shareholder are the people in our community. And again, we just ask you to, to take a look at the health of your organization and have a strong city, a smart city, a vibrant city. You gotta have democracy and there's a correlation to having a strong press. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we, we don't have too much time left, but uh, you know, uh, Terry, thanks for that. And um, one of the, you know, you cited some statistics. The one I like to cite for people, and you know, we, we talked about this 
before is, um, I know that at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, this is true, and I'm sure it's true in Philadelphia as well, we have the more readers today than we have ever had in our entire history. When you combine online, the print edition, all the ways people can access, and I'm sure that's, I'm sure that's true in Philadelphia. But meanwhile, our finances are, are weakened incredibly. So when Terry talks about how the business model is, has been shaken up and some of what's going on, I mean, think about that for a second. In your town, this will be true, wherever you come from. The local newspaper probably has more readers than ever and is having a tougher time financially than ever. In what kind of world do you grow the number of customers you have, reach more people, and somehow get worse financial results? And that's, that's what's going on, and that's putting democracy at risk. At, on the front lines of, of America in small towns like Youngstown, where the editor there is a friend of mine. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very sad story. And it could happen. It could, unless we figure this out, that this could happen. I wanted to ask the reporters, how has that changed for the newsroom? I mean, the, the idea, the awareness of what's going on, I mean, um, and what do you think about as you do your work under those circumstances? Because I'm sure you've heard that from him before. Um, it, it's, a few times. Yeah, <laughs> not quite like that. It was really powerful. Um, it's, it's stressful, to be honest. I've, I've never been, I've been in this business um, since 1991. I've seen a lot of changes, a lot of cutbacks. I've seen, you know, the best of it and the worst of it. Um, but as Terry was saying, it, it is, it's so very much important, but, you know, unfortunately, we've trained people to think of their news as something free and not valuable. So when I think about doing a story, I think about how to engage the audience in, in a different way because we are in a different era. So for instance, for our um, Toxic City Six Schools, we put together a, a, a database that parents could go to and literally type in their school and find out what is the condition in there, how much peeling and chipping lead paint is there in my child's classroom so that we can engage readers in a way that reminds them that, that we are evolving as the new, you know, we're trying to evolve and engage them and, um, and, and we're trying to think outside the box. But it's a, it is a, it's a very scary time and people make fun of, um, you know, the Washington Post motto like, you know, democracy dies in darkness, but that's, that's exactly right, that's true. And, and what I really loved about our project was that we involved the community in the process itself and, um, and we found that they want to be a part of it, and I think that the more we do that, the more we can convince them that it's worth the investment because knowledge is power. I mean, when, do you think about, like, what if we couldn't do these stories? I mean, who would do them? Do you? Yeah, because I think um, for me and most reporters I know, journalism is in our blood. Like, since the time I was in high school, it's all I ever wanted to do. And, um, it's not like we're becoming millionaires doing this job. We absolutely love doing this job and love doing things where we're, we are the voice for the voiceless. We can fight for things that are right and try to, you know, make the wrongs, expose the wrongs and get change as a result. So I think as a reporter, obviously I don't, I'm not on the business side of it, but I think you keep thinking like this has to stay like this we have to be able to keep doing this because it's important work. And I think we have a lot of responsibility as reporters. What we write and what we put online is with, out there forever. And it does change things. Um, and I think it's such an important, vital part of our democracy that we just, there's kind of a, um, I mean, I remember sometimes Wendy and I have been working on a project and said like, what if we can't finish it? What if the paper goes away before we can finish it? And that won't happen, but I think there's, there is that voice in your head that, that tells you that we've just got to keep going because it is, it's part of our identity, it's who we are, and we do feel like we're on a mission and, and we don't want it to end. We, 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 and we're in, is maybe better financial shape than many of our peers, and we just had to you know, say goodbye to 60 colleagues this summer. And so it's, it's very, very, very real. And I would say there are three things that, that maybe leave with in, in terms of 
what, what can we do about it in terms of, if, if you believe in the importance of it, what can change the dynamic? And I think one is that, you know, it's just that idea of, you know, that people even digitally subscribe or pay for it. I, I'm always amazed at, you know, I don't blink about paying 250 for a cup of coffee every day or people pay a dollar for a bottle of water. And, you know, that notion of, you know, digitally online, your digital's a dollar a day for the content that newsrooms produce, that's meaningful. Secondly, I think that um, increasingly philanthropy in some form or some combination of subscription and or membership or donations large and small to support work uh, of journalism is going to be necessary in this country and I think it's going to have to just be a, a consistent piece of the revenue stream. But the third is just, uh, and, and Kevin's been involved in this too, I was in DC with, uh, with some colleagues that, who lead news organizations uh, this week lobbying with uh, both there's, a, there's legislation in the House, bipartisan, and in the Senate, bipartisan, and I can't think of much that's bipartisan getting joint support right now for legislation, and it's uh, called the Journalism um, Preservation, or Journalism Competition Preservation Act. And what it's asking for, and would ask for your support, is simply this. It, it's asking for the ability of the news organization to collectively have a safe harbor uh, from antitrust uh, concerns to be able to collectively negotiate with the platforms on different terms. And we're not asking for regulation, we're not asking for a breakup, we're not asking for anything other than to have the leverage of the ability of the collective entities of news organizations to talk to the platform because none of us have enough authority or leverage otherwise. And in that conversation, you know, it's a matter of think about if you manufactured something every day, you know, like content or shorts or TVs or whatever you might manufacture, and you invested all the capital and that was your intellectual property, and yet somebody could come by your dock, pick up the product that you had, they distribute it, and they cash all of the money for it. That's kind of the scenario that we're in here. They know the, the content's value to them. We know their distribution is valuable to us. It's in it in both of our interests. It would be good for the platforms long term to have news be viable. It's certainly valuable to us to be able to keep our journalists employed and doing their work, but long term it's really invaluable to the American people. And to an individual city. All right, I'm going to ask each person to make one final point before I close out. The, I mean, just we have this group here of people interested in, in cities and their communities. I mean, what one thing do you absolutely want them to know? And whoever wants to go first can go first. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> you go first. Oh. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, I, I, I certainly don't want to give the impression just the last thought that Philadelphia is this like, you know, pit of misery. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful city with wonderful people. Obviously and, wonderful yeah. people, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we're lucky and fortunate to work in a city like Philadelphia. And uh, I just wanted to give it a, a plug since Toxic City is not exactly like the best PR for the city, but it's a wonderful city and I encourage you to come and come to our newsroom, um, look us up, we'll take you for coffee and we'll make you buy uh, a subscription. A <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one thing is that um, we're very fortunate to work in Philadelphia because we couldn't have done this project without the Lenfest Foundation and without the grant we had to do the testing. And we also couldn't have done it unless we had editors and um, publishers who were willing to give us the time to do it. And um, you do see like a lot of newspapers holding on to their investigative team because investigative journalism is, is, is so very important to our country, our democracy, and it's the watchdog. And so I think that however newspapers are able to do it across the country or news outlets are able to do it, um, it just has to stay alive. Um, well, I think I'd just channel Jerry and say, as he used to say, what would Philadelphia be without the Enquirer? And in your community, what would your community be without your leading news organization doing their work? And if you believe that's important, or just ask that you find ways to support it, learn more about it, and uh, support the legislation that we're trying to do. And, and also uh, hold us accountable, because we don't always get it right either, and we sure want to. And yeah. thank you so much for letting us have this opportunity today. Uh, I'll leave you with one thought. Uh, wherever you're going to go back to today uh, or tomorrow or whenever you leave Atlanta, do one simple thing. Subscribe to the local newspaper if you're not. 
And I guarantee you that if you spend 15 minutes with it every day, you'll be the smartest person you know. And if you're from Atlanta, <laughs> talk to me afterwards. I'll sign you up mm -hmm. right now. <laughs> and I'll give you my office phone number, and you can call me anytime with any story idea or complaint that you have. So thank you.